All right, this is the exciting topic that everyone is looking forward to. So how many folks have been through an LCME visit? How many folks have them upcoming in the near future? Okay, so uh, I used to say this was PTSD and now it's probably converted to an anxiety disorder because our next LCME visit is coming up in March of 2020. Um, anybody uh, on the LCME in the group? Okay, um, so it's always good to know your audience. So we're, I'm gonna go over some things that I think are important for you to think about, both in terms of how you can actually help facilitate the accreditation process, but also there's some important ways and if you're an elective clerkship and you want to become a required clerkship, that you might leverage because you have unique aspects. And so the, how many people who have actually seen the accreditation standards? Okay, so I, I became a clerkship director literally when the then current clerkship director didn't show up for work because he was in the resuscitation bay. I got a phone call when I was in Italy saying we need you to, be, to start a new clerkship tomorrow. And then like the following year there was an LCME visit and, and, and you know when you're an elective people pretty much left me alone and I could do my own thing and there weren't a ton of oversight, but then when we became a required clerkship, it suddenly became a, a lot bigger um, sort of issues, and not one that my school necessarily provided us with training along the way for. And so the, the next big thing was sort of the LCME is coming, and what are you going to do, and how, how are you meeting all of these standards, which I honestly did not know really existed. So I'd encourage you, if you're new in your role, to go ahead and actually pull those out and have a good idea of what it is that people are going to expect of you. And there, there are a list of standards that the um, LCME expects compliance with. A number of these go beyond the clerkship and are at the institutional level. And those aren't things that you're necessarily going to be able to impact but within your specialty. Um, but there really is an opportunity for you to improve your clerkship as a result of these. So understanding what the standards actually say, thinking about this as a continuous quality improvement process. A lot of times our faculty at least um, are like moaning and groaning and I can't believe they're coming in again and we're gonna have to do something different and what, how does this fit in? And the negativity of that interaction doesn't actually help us in, improve. And so it, this is really about a process for self-assessment. So they lay out what the standards are. They expect that as a medical school and institution that you're looking at programmatic level outcomes to see how your students are performing and how they're achieving the um, institutional objectives. And, they're, and ultimately, this is going to be reviewed by your institutional stakeholders. So there's a data collection instrument, which is like a 150-page document that requests everything from copies of every policy that you possibly have to what your step scores are to what individual clerkship reviews look like. Um, they're going to... Um, there's going to be an inst a student self-survey that the students actually administer and they provide you feedback as well. You're going to take this information and utilize it in committees to identify what are your strengths and weaknesses and ideally you'll come up with a self-improvement plan before the LCME comes as opposed to having the process completely lay out to you what needs to be changed. And, um, and then they're actually going to use all of this information to externally um, judge the performance of your program. And then we're in the slow change mode. All right, so they, uh, several years ago, they actually revised all the accreditation standards and they have grouped them into 12 standards with 93 elements. And you'll notice that um, the elements six through um, nine really have the most to do with the educational program. So your, your competencies, your curricular objectives and design, the curricular content, curricular management, and teaching supervision assessment, those are things that really fall within the curriculum for what your rotation is. Um, medical student selection and progress, career advising sometimes has a lot to do with 
with our role as advisors, but a lot of those actually fall within the student affairs um, kind of division if you're, if you're divided that way at your institution. And so the time frame, really, the, you begin planning for this typically about a year and a half in advance in order to be able to lay this out and have time to be able to engage and change the aspects that need to be changed. Um, we actually started about a year earlier in order to be able to review all of the information. And I think one of the challenges with the LCME is depending upon what your infrastructure is, the sort of big data of medical education, your informatics, has really tremendously changed, I think, over the past 10 years. And so if you have a system that um, really supports being able to spit out data and be able to look at it with a lot without a lot of sort of personnel having to manipulate it, you're probably in a much better place than if you're, if you're really reliant on yourself and some Excel spreadsheets. And so the, the more support and infrastructure you have, the better off you are. And um, so, so again, as we mentioned, this is about improvement. So they aren't looking for perfection in programs. And I think sometimes that's one of the struggles is we think that they are. Sometimes it seems as if there's a hidden meaning that they say that they don't have one ideal way, and yet it seems like sometimes they do have an ideal way that it isn't quite clear. And so balancing those can be challenging at times, but really um, it, it's, most, it's really about you implementing the change process. And so typically the way this comes out is there's the satisfactory, satisfactory with a need for monitoring where they're going to come back and review some of the various aspects and unsatisfactory. Um, typically these are things that are going to be um, things related to citations for prior LCME accreditation visits. So if you actually have a required clerkship, I would strongly urge you to go back to prior citations and see how, how this is linked and if you in any way can contribute to improve prior citations. So if there are challenges with curriculum or with student assessment, um, those are, are things that are incredibly helpful. And the, the student survey report, which is late, it's typically within that nine months to a year, the student information is going to provide you additional data, but that, that's really close in the time frame. Um, ideally, you, your schools would be providing you with data on a yearly basis about what the um, AAMC GQ questionnaire is because you can begin to identify um, aspects that are challenging within the curriculum. The downside of that is that there are pretty few things that are specifically related to emergency medicine. And some of the things that are held, that the other core clerkships hold you accountable for, like things like direct observation, was I observed directly performing a history? Was I directly um, observed performing a physical exam? Those aren't questions that are parsed out in emergency medicine, though there are opportunities for us to be able to leverage the memory of students, especially if we have a fourth year rotation and the students are coming to us um, later in their educational um, career. There is nothing worse than actually being surprised by things that come up in, in your LCME review close to the fact. So our last LCME review, one of the challenges was that we had a blip the year before the LCME came regarding the mistreatment, um, and, and I think Joe's been with us, that we're really pretty nice to students overall. We think we're incredibly nice. As we did more education related to policies though, the mistreatment reports went up. And then what we found out is that you're getting this information on the GQ, but if you do not have a process institutionally to be able to identify these things as they are going on in your institution and to be able to address them in a time-honored type of uh, metric, then you're not finding out until after the student graduates. And there's sometimes a four-year delay in that information depending upon when it occurred. And so it's very difficult to impact change only with the GQ questionnaire that you, you really have to consider institutionally what processes you're going to put in place earlier.
right? And so one of the things that we try to do, and, and when we look at the LCME most frequently cited standards, the things that we've already discussed, the learning environment and professionalism as well as student mistreatment, which really go hand in hand, those are things that don't come up till later, but we try to be transparent in our processes with the students of, if we don't know what the challenges are, including some pretty specific information about what the situation was, we can't actually change behaviors in individual faculty members. At the same time, recognizing that students have concerns about how that's reported, we try to cluster that information and we release it um, either on a quarterly basis or uh, twice a year. And if the student specifically doesn't want it reported until after they graduate, then we have, um, we have an ombuds person who actually can help navigate that situation so that we can begin to address behaviors but not explicitly um, describe a situation that the student doesn't want um, disclosed. Self-directed um, and lifelong learning are challenges. It's hard for us to think about assessment of those and the LCME really wants us to know where are we teaching this and how are we explicitly assessing these things. And so this becomes important sometimes relative to the clerkship and coming up with some of those goals and objectives and, that you can do both at the beginning of the rotation and being able to follow that up. Um, the curriculum design, preparation of residents, we touched on this before. Residents as teachers is a required aspect of, of the L accreditation standards. And so sometimes as the clerkship director, you're in a nebulous position of, you're in charge of the clerkship, so you're responsible for making this happen but you have to collaborate both with your program director as well as your chair in order to ensure that this occurs. And whether it happens at an institutional level for the GME or whether it actually happens individually within your department, both of those are acceptable options. And then the assessment system, which is key. So this, these are the sort of the expressions on our faculty members' faces as we talk about LCME. There's dread, there's groaning, there's outrage, there's pure panic. And so you probably recognize some of your, your faculty members um, as, as well as you think about this. But what, um, what I wanted to talk about more specifically was how do you specifically contribute as the clerkship director? So when we think about the assessment, um, system, 9.4 actually requires that students in required clerkships are directly observed. Really the data focuses on the core, typically the traditional third year clerkships, and that's what the GQ questions are related to. But it's really helpful sometimes, we, even when you have them and have students sign forms, it's incredibly easy to forget about it because it is a very small portion of the total clinical experience. And so if you have that closer in the fourth year, sometimes it helps them temporarily remember the, those types of things have occurred, but it also helps give them the trajectory over time over how are they, how are they growing and developing as a learner. And it shows if you have a portfolio or a coaching system, it really helps think about what are the specific aspects of the history and physical that they need to improve upon. And it's interesting because I think most medical students feel pretty comfortable when you look at the EPAs relative to um, how performing an HMP. And yet if you talk to us as the faculty member side or the program director side, I think people are really concerned, do they know how to ask that more sophisticated type of question? How do you hone into the, to the focused history and physical? And so that's our responsibility as clerkship directors is to help, help them grow. Um, there are other options for this, as we talked about before, OSCE simulations. We actually have three OSCE cases at the end of our clerkship that provides some of the assessment component. I think we know that clinical uh, observations can be relatively um, subjective and depending upon the type of shift you had, it sometimes is difficult to provide the student with very objective feedback, but OSCEs do provide you another way in which to provide this um, feedback. And it can actually be um, other requirements are that students receive narrative feedback and formative assessment. So it doesn't all have to contribute to a grade, but these are other ways in which you can help fulfill the, the accreditation standards. Um, both the standard 6.2 and 8.6 have to do with required clinical experiences and how you monitor those. 
So you're, how many people are involved in the curriculum committee? So a good number of people. So these are typically de defined by the curriculum committee. If you have a clinical, every, every school has a different structure for these, but you have to actually define what the condition is, where the student is seeing these, whether it's inpatient or outpatient, what type of patient, what, what type of responsibility they have, and if they don't see it in the clinical space, how they fulfill that. So we have some things on our list that sometimes can be challenging um, to be able to, be able to um, see. Uh, um, some airway management can be difficult for every student to perform on a real life patient who happens to be on a ventilator needing to be bagged. But the LCMA is actually going to ask you to respond to if you have greater than 25% of these procedures performed outside of the clinical situation or setting, what are those and why, why are those? And so I think you have to have a, if you're having to have students do um, document chest pain performed in a simulation lab, they're really going to question why not all students are actually able to see that within the clinical setting. And so it's both the, um, the laying out and the process oriented for, for the development of these, but there's also monitoring. So when we, when we first instituted this, we actually thought, well, students, they're adults, everybody can do this anytime in any of their rotation over any aspect of the clinical years, and by the time they graduate, we want this to be fulfilled. What we found is, you know, if you don't inspect it regularly, it doesn't get done because documentation doesn't seem that important, and it's like resident procedure logs. Nobody gets real excited about documenting the stuff that you're doing anyway. And so then I'm like emailing every student in the school asking, you know, trying to get the completion of this. So we actually ended up assigning this by clerkships, of which a large number of ours actually fall within the emergency medicine required clerkship because we can guarantee that most any general complaint, a student is going to be able to see abdominal pain and chest pain and a respiratory illness, a cardiac arrhythmia, and those types of things within the emergency department setting. So that is a significant way for you to contribute. It's also, I think, very noticed sometimes. So for us, there's a hard stop at the clerkship level. If a student doesn't uh, fulfill these, that they can't actually complete the clerkship. And so making sure that you help with that process is greatly appreciated. And we end up, um, we require that students document one, but it does help when you are looking at the, um, that their standardization across sites, it does help and provides you potentially with another um, area of information relative to what types of procedures are you seeing at various sites and are they equally distributed. Um, this is an absolute must that all grades have to be turned in within the first six weeks. When I was running an elective, I had no idea that this was coming, um, and I didn't, I didn't understand that. We really strive for four weeks because we're trying to track that and measure that, but if the LCME is going to ask for the number of days that it takes for the average clerkship to be able to, to turn in their grades. and they want it reported on a cohort by cohort basis. So our student affairs office tracks this. And um, so it, it's just one of those things, it's straightforward, there's not a lot of option in that, but just to make sure everyone was aware. And that's they don't ask specifically about away rotations. Right. Yeah, and and we report um, all of our required clerkships, so EM falls within that. I think that it's a lot more questionable as to the aways, but certainly, it, it's not beneficial to students if they're not getting their grades and feedback relative to rotations until you know four months later. Which brings us to formative assessment and feedback, a, a, another requirement. And it really, it speaks to the students having sufficient time for remediation. And it actually requires this in all four years of the curriculum. So um, it could be formative quizzes, 
I think in emergency medicine, this is a really ideal situation for us to sit down and discuss with the students, and, it's, um, and it feeds into that mid-rotation feedback. But we actually have the students do some self-assessment, and several of folks have spoken to this already. It's the opportunity for the students to really thinking about, think about what they're doing well and what they need to improve on, how this fits into their career plan. If you want to be a pediatrician, we have like a million folks with ears in the emergency department to be able to look at and appreciate the nuances. And so this is one of those skills that's really a challenge when we see it in residents and they don't and they can't identify what their strengths and weaknesses are. Though people with who lack that insight are very challenging to remediate. So helping them develop these skills. None of us were born with that skill. Most of us sort of muddled through it and figured it out along the way. But this is really a structured way for us to um, provide this, the student with feedback. All right. Um, and then we have a standardized uh, form that all of our clerkships use so that we are making sure that we provide the student with the formative feedback at the midpoint of the rotation. And it, it allows us to review those required clinical experiences. We actually have in, um, incorporated the describe any professionalism concerns or concerns of mistreatment because sometimes as the clerkship director, the student really does trust you to be able to navigate this um, and they want to discuss, discuss it. It isn't something that's required in any way, but it does give us an opportunity to actually begin to broach some of, of that. I think for students, depending upon where they are in their career trajectory, emergency medicine tends to be a lot more of a vocal specialty. We tend to go ahead and say what we think, and our language isn't always the best within our space, at least. I will, um, and so really thinking about how to help residents and faculty think about that. I think it's important for us to have a, a safe environment in which we can debrief and get whatever out of our system that we need to before we go into the next room. But you know, I'm sure Mickey Mouse is not always real pleased when kids spill ice cream on his shoes every day um, at Disney World. And so thinking about what are the things that are appropriate to say in an open space versus what are some of the conversations that you need to have in a closed space that are important. But um, getting a feel in the gut chat for where, what the students are experiencing is helpful. Um, as we mentioned before, we use the shift cards. And so I think about these as being formative feedback. Each individual shift only really counts a very small percentage of their ultimate grade. And so we have the opportunity, unlike many of the other core clerkships, to provide students with ongoing feedback about how they're performing so that they can change that as they're going through the rotation, as opposed to being four weeks in before they're necessarily getting formal written feedback. And um, like I said before, if anybody is interested in, in being part of the NCAT consortium, let me know and we can get you involved with that. Curriculum management is very challenging in that it requires that everyone map their, their topics and it, it ensures that everything is appropriately covered. So one of the big challenges is that your institutional learning objectives are supposed to drive every clerkship. Um, in some recent discussions relative to LCME, I think one of the things that many of us fall back on is the fact that there are nationally derived clerkship objectives that we can use. The LCME is actually doesn't always want to hear that. They want to hear how it links to your own institutional learning objectives. And it has been described to me that this should be like a waterfall that drives everything else. So I think there's ways to use the information, but to make sure that it ties in locally. Um, these things then have to, um, since my primary job right now is in medical education, I think everyone hates me relative to curriculum mapping. So if you're a required clerkship and you are getting requests for keywords or what your objectives are for your, um, for your either simulation or didactic sessions, that's because the expectation now is that if the LCME comes and asks, where do you teach cardiac arrest? that you can input this into your system and derive where throughout your curriculum, um, throughout the medical students for your experience, 
they were taught about these specifically. I would encourage you that if you have, if you, that using natural language is very challenging because you could use coronary artery disease, unstable angina, MI, and it's actually challenging to find that information. Um, but, but all of these things need to go before your curriculum committee and be approved in order, uh, especially if there are any changes to your objectives. And that's one of the challenges as a new clerkship director. There's not like a, um, a sort of a list, and many times this is learning as you, as you go. All right. Um, again, these are, these are opportunities. If you look at your curriculum, most of the time there's a process for course or clerkship review. And so engaging in that process, it's really challenging to do these clerkship reviews. We're all colleagues with one another. Um, nobody wants to engage in one of these when everyone's like, my clerkship's perfect. Most of the time your medical school is actually looking for ways to help you improve. And this is one of those ways in order for you to leverage resources. So if you're looking to give an MBME exam or you're looking for better assessment modalities and you need funding to support those, Using these um, curriculum revisions as an opportunity to leverage new resources is an opportunity that should not be passed up. So if you don't have enough computer workstations within your clinical space, or you need money to fund examinations, or you need help with simulation supplies, this is a good opportunity if you feel like when you're um, looking at your clerkship and that you've identified ways to improve it that you can um, leverage a change um, and support from the school. All right, I think I'm going to give up on this. And so um, making sure that your competency, they are going to look at your clerkship objectives, so making sure that they use Bloom's taxonomy and are all reported in competency-based terms. They should all be linked to your institutional learning objectives. And all of them should have measurable outcomes, which is incredibly difficult when you're thinking about how do you measure the outcomes of students actually being self-directed and developing lifelong learning goals. But those are worthwhile thinking about institutionally and how can you tackle that beyond your clerkship. Um, as I noted before, all of the faculty and residents have to know your objectives and they have to be distributed on a yearly basis. Um, and you have to provide training. I will tell you one of, I think, the key misses for us. I think we do a lot of this. I think the documentation of this can be particularly challenging. And so making sure that you've documented with a signature or with an electronic delivery or thinking about what is your departmental process to making sure that these are distributed is a huge sticking point. And it has been one that we have met with challenges because inevitably, you know, you're doing your residence teaching within your, within your um, conference curriculum and the resident worked an overnight shift or they're out sick or they're on a different rotation. And so thinking about how you're going to supply this, um, but they, they specifically ask for how do you document that. We touched on this before and this was sort of making me, um, we're very fortunate that all of our students rotate through our singular site, but if you have multiple sites, you have to be able to demonstrate comparability. And those are particularly tricky and, you know, like what we talked about before, if you can't write notes at some sites or at others. But if you have, there, there are ways in which to look at this. You need to probably be looking at are their grades and their outcomes similar? Are they seeing the same types of procedures and clinical experiences? How do you augment that? And do they all have the same access to simulation or didactics? Um, but they're going to ask, how do you ensure that it's comparable if you are a distributed campus? Um, again, the making sure that they receive feedback. At our institution, and Nick touched on this already, that typically you cannot be involved in assessing students if, if you are treating the students. Largely, I think this is in reference to the psychiatric services, um, but there are time, and largely the emergency department has been left as more of an exempt status from this. However, we did have a student that had to be 
um, involuntarily committed while um, in the ED, actually on another service, and the student was on uh, psychiatry and actually um, became acutely psychotic, which was very challenging. And so making sure that these situations that you have no role, I think if you saw the student for a sprained ankle, probably nobody remembers that if they were an M1 and when it happened. But if you're treating the student for a sexually um, transmitted infection or something that's perceived as sensitive, making sure that you're not involved in the assessment or evaluation process is incredibly important. Um, this is one of the EPAs, that, and it's, uh, there's been increased emphasis placed on this within the, um, for, for students' collaboration. And so this is something we really have an opportunity for students to think about the, the role of the team and how other members of the interprofessional team might evaluate or assess student communication to them as interprofessionals. And this might be something that you as an EM rotation bring a very unique aspect to. So these are the things every year have to be done, um, making sure you address the, the concerns, making sure that um, you have an affiliation agreement and faculty appointments and documenting them all. That will make life much easier. Any questions related to LCME? I know it's everyone's favorite topic. All right, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to contact me and be happy to provide any information or mistakes that we have made in the process.